Hallelujah. Let us stand to praise and worship God this morning. Heavenly Father, we just give thanks for this day as we even approach a time of thanksgiving. Lord God, we give thanks that you are our God and we have this place to come to worship. Father, we pray that you join us together, unite us as one, as we lift our voice to you in praise and adoration. And Father, we give thanks and all God's people said, amen.
in emotions. <laughs> Mind, will, and emotions. Bless the Lord today. Hallelujah. Around. I will put 
rising eyes are turning to you we turn to you hope is stirring hearts are yearning for you we long for you cause when we see When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away.
displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art How great Thou art Then sings my soul
God, you are so good. And Father, we just give thanks for this day and for your word and where you're bringing us, where you're taking us. Lord, may we continue to learn your truths. And Father, may we abide by them. And Lord, may we not get caught up with all the traditions and customs where we put those and install those into our life more than your word. Nothing wrong with traditions, nothing wrong with customs, as long as they bring a reminder of who you are in our life, Lord God, but not supersede your word. And so, Father, we just thank you for this day that we can gather together as family and hear your word this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Just a, a couple things. Uh, we are doing the comparison of the Lord's Prayer in Greek, which we get our English from, to the Hebrew Matthew. I have a handout. Somebody had asked if we could do a side-by-side -side comparison. So I have this here. If, any, if you're interested, if you could raise your hand and uh, we'll pass them out to you and give you something to kind of go with. One of the things someone else had brought up was the fact that that words that I'm sharing with you for the Hebrew Lord's Prayer are different than what they've been finding on the internet. Let me explain why. There are different kinds of Hebrew, number one. You have modern Hebrew now, and you have the biblical Hebrew, and then there's ancient Hebrew. When Matthew was written, where I'm showing and teaching with you is the Hebrew Matthew, the biblical Hebrew. Also remember that the Hebrew that they're probably doing is they're taking the Greek version of the Lord's Prayer, which we have our English with, and they're copying, the, they're putting that into Hebrew. So there might be different words because some of the words and the way it's spoken is different. We got that? Yeah. All right, just to bring clarity into that. Okay, so what I'm sharing with you is from the Hebrew Matthew and the uh, biblical Hebrew. Amen? Yeah. Okay. How many of you are excited? How many of you are still and have hope what's going on? I just need to just kind of share this before I get going. We have a lot to be thankful for. And God is still on the throne and God is still in charge. And we have been seeing this trial with, with Kyle Rittenhouse. And I'm so glad that the jury did not succumb to the pressures of media and all of that, but stood fast to the law. Yep. We have become too much already a lawless nation. And this would have just been one more step into lawlessness. We try to look at all the things that happened and occurred before, but what it comes down to is the very moment of what pressure he was under when the time came when he pulled the trigger. And it was kind of comical to hear the prosecutor's main witness admit that he pointed a gun at him before he even so much as raised his gun and fired a shot. Right there is self-defense. And any way you look at it, he tried to flee, he tried to get out of the way, and he felt his life was in danger. And so be it. We don't need to get into the history of those who were shot and what their past was or anything, but we need to take it right down to the moment of where his mind was at when things happened. So we need to lift him and his family up in prayer as well because this, this young man's life will never be the same. There'll be traumatic things that he'll be going through, a lot even caused by the media, never mind what he endured during that time of having to shoot. He went there to help people. Did he go about it maybe the wrong way? That's, that's questionable, that could possibly be. But regardless, his intentions were good to go and to help and protect a town that it seems the politicians and everyone else could care less about the businesses that were burning down and the destruction that was taking place. God is a God of law. Amen. He is not a lawless God. And we need to maintain and be vigilant in understanding the laws of God and following the laws of God. And I believe this is why we are in the problems that we are in as a nation. Because our nation has turned its back on God, the standards of God and the morals of God according to his word. But he will, his will shall be done, right? Yep. Shall be done, amen? amen? In heaven and on earth, we read last week. Repeat after me. Avinu, Shabbat Shemayim, Yit Kadesh, 
Shimka. Vijit Barach. Malkutka. Ratsunka. Yehie. Asui. Bashamayam. U Vaaretz. Our Father in heaven, may your name be sanctified. May your kingdom be blessed. Your will shall be done in heaven and on earth. And that last phrase last week, we learned, your will shall be done in heaven and on earth, that it's a call to action for us to be obedient to God's will. That if we are going to learn the will of God and the will of God and become the people that God wants us to be, we have to learn to submit to the will of God. God is sovereign. Therefore, our prayer should start with declaring the sovereignty of God which is how Yeshua begins the Lord's Prayer, the Avinu Prayer, where he declares God as his Father, where? In heaven. In heaven. Followed by, may your name be sanctified. And this is why the Jewish prayers begin many times with Baruch, Ata Adonai, Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, because he is just that. And that is how he desires to be worshipped as well. Because God is sovereign and we are sons and daughters of the Most High God, we need to understand that even though there is a force of evil that works against the will of God, we as the people of God, as the sons and daughters of the Most High God, have been given power and authority to overcome in the name of Yeshua and in the name of Yahovah. Luke 10, 18, Yeshua said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing, say nothing, nothing. shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. Know that whatever the enemy does to come against the will of God, our heavenly father can cause everything everything, everything to come together for good. So no matter what we see happening around us now, no, God can flip it. God can turn it around if our people who are called by his name will humble ourselves and pray, amen? amen. And seek his face. Seek the kingdom of God. And seek his righteousness. Romans 8, 27, and he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You have the Holy Spirit within you, and the Holy Spirit within you is interceding for you, for the will of God. Amen? Amen. And we know that for those who love God, all things, say all things, all work things. together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So the question lies with, are you called according to his purpose? See, there's stipulations in some of the things, and we don't sometimes like to read the fine print. Right? We don't like to read. We, we just take what we see here, and we want to apply that, but we don't want to have to change. We don't want to have to convert to the ways of God, the fine print that he gives us. Those who are called according to his purpose. Understand and know that each and every one of us has a calling and a purpose on our life, whether you know it or not. And if you don't know it, you need to find it. When we look at the Greek version of the Lord's Prayer, we see it as a call to action to do God's will, whereby the Hebrew version contains a statement of fact. Say fact. fact. Your will shall be done. Not maybe, not if, or you know, if you feel good that day, God, you know, if you could just throw me a bone here or there. No, his will shall be done. Understand to proclaim that God's will shall be done in heaven and on earth, that nothing is beyond his control. With God, nothing is impossible, neither in the spiritual realm or in the complete entire physical universe. Can I hear an amen? amen. These Hebrew words therefore express the fact that our Heavenly Father is all powerful. So take heart that God's will shall be done in your life, in your job in your family, in your circumstance, and even in your situation. Through this prayer, Yeshua is teaching his followers to believe and pray with a confidence, a confidence that God's will shall be done. Amen? Amen. And what he says shall be done. It shall be accomplished, and it shall be completed. Yes. So take heart. Yeshua is coming. He is returning. 
uh, be aware the fall feasts are signs and signals of his return. And God has decided. And he says that these are my feast days. In other words, these are the fall feasts. These are, I've given to you as signs of the times and seasons in which you will be aware and understand that a time is coming when the Messiah will return. It is his will, and which means this, it is going to happen. <laughs> now let's move to the next line, which is, if we can just show the third slide of the comparisons, if we have it up here, amen. The comparison number three. This is a perfect time, I believe, for us to get into this verse. The next one of the Avinu prayer, the Lord's prayer. In the King James Version, it says, give us this day our daily bread. And it's a time of where we give thanks and pray to God for his sustenance. This is how and things we have been taught to believe, right? But how many know that it goes much deeper than that? And we look at the Hebrew, Matthew, and it says, give us our bread continually. Say continually. continually. A little different than just daily. Daily can be bases here or there, but continually is forever. As a kid growing up, I remember my mom sending me to the corner store. I lived on a housing project, and down the end of our street was like a, a package store. You always have a package store at a project, you know that. And then you had the uh, convenience store, and it was a laundromat in different places. But we'd go to the corner store to pick up things like milk or bread when we need it. And so she'd give me 25 cents, because that's how much bread cost when I was a kid. Not that I'm dating myself. But 25 cents got you a loaf of bread. And when we would have the loaf of bread, we'd bring it home. And more times than not, because none of us in our house really liked the crust, we only ate it if we had to. But it'd stay in the bread drawer. And after a period, short period of time, the bread would begin to get moldy. And mold would grow on it. And it was a time where we would know, this bread is no longer good. We're not going to eat it. It's got mold on it. The bread aged and you could taste the freshness eventually going out of it to where then you began to see the mold form on it. Unlike the bread in the stores today, the freshness comes out of the bread a little bit. You can pop it in the toaster and still eat it, right? But you rarely see mold grow on bread today. Do you ever notice that? Do you ever have a loaf of bread hang around for a long period of time that you forgot about and you pull it out and you realize there's no mold growing on it? Because you got all the chemicals that are in that bread that we're digesting in our systems. Isn't that nice and rewarding to hear this morning? <laughs> but there were also times when we could go to the Hostess Outlet Store. And the Hostess Outlet Store was where you could get things even cheaper than 25 cents for a loaf of bread. The expiration date had, had been you know, over on the loaf of bread, so they couldn't sell it in the store, so they'd bring it to these outlets. And people would just go to that place on a particular day because they knew that Tuesday was the day that, you know, all new stuff was going to be brought in. You know, the bread, the devil dogs, the uh, yodels and, you know, all that good stuff for you, you know. The hostess cupcakes that at that time really had chocolate frosting on them. You know, not that plastic stuff that you get now that you can peel off and throw like a Frisbee, right? But then you'd go in there and you'd buy a loaf of bread for like, say, 10 cents. And you didn't mind that the date was expired because more than likely it would... You know, last you, you know, a good amount of time, you know, especially when you got three men growing up in a house with my mom and stuff, you know, with my brothers were like 10 and 6 years older than me. So food didn't last in the house, and I was usually at the bottom of the food chain, amen. But there would be times, again, when things would expire. But my point of this is, is that we didn't matter going and buying expired bread because we were poor. We didn't have much money. And my mom would do whatever it took to keep food on the table. And I bring this up because in Israel, many Jews who emigrated to Israel came from other countries where starvation is real. And they consider bread to be a sacred thing. I'm speaking even of today. So when the bread began to grow stale for those who were financially able to buy fresh bread, they would take their older bread and they would put it in plastic in a plastic bag or wrap it some way somehow and put it outside on a stoop or on a wall or somewhere for those who were maybe less fortunate and didn't have enough would at least be able to get some older bread that was still good, edible, and they would be satisfied. 
In the time of Yeshua, I'm sure there were many who considered a piece of bread a high commodity. To where one can sense the importance of praying for our daily bread, no matter what your financial status is. Over the years, times have changed, especially when it comes to government subsidies and social programs. Being on welfare when I was growing up, and we were on welfare, but understand this, it was only for a temporary time. Welfare wasn't always continuously just money pouring out. There was a time limit. And my mom, being divorced, raising three boys, had to go out and get a job, and she knew the time limit that was going to be running out when the welfare check would no longer be coming in. And so seeing this and understanding this, seeing how hard she worked even as a single mom made us kids to grow up and learn to appreciate the importance of hard work and the responsibility that we have growing up and that someday we would be fathers and have to take on a responsibility of putting food on the table and having a job and supporting a family. I remember many nights hearing my mom pray, praying for our daily bread, along with clothing and enough money to pay the bills. She would have scriptures taped around the house, especially on the refrigerator. I can do, this was her favorite, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I remember her coming home and sitting at the dinner table and we would have things, well I won't say what they call it today, but a piece of toast with chipped beef on it and some gravy. And that would be our main dinner. And veg all on tuna fish on toast. But you know what? As a kid growing up, you ate. You didn't think about what other people ate. How come we don't have this or how come we don't have that? And to be honest with you, we didn't have video games. So my only concern was when I got into eat, eating was a chore. Because I would much rather be outside playing, out in the woods playing ball or whatever, than have to come in to eat. And I hated having steak because steak took too long to chew. <laughs> even though we only had that maybe once a month. But on the side note here, things would, because we didn't have the money, we did what we needed to do. Give us our bread. Give us our bread. The Hebrew word is tamid, which in the English is more difficult to translate. And what you're going to find in the Hebrew language is that there are just no English words and at times even Greek words that can translate what the Hebrew word means. Because this word to me in the Hebrew has a more deeper meaning than any English word we can give it. The closest word in the English we can give to define to me is the word continually. Or the preferred word that we have is daily. And due to some slight variations within the various Hebrew Matthew manuscripts, this line of the Avinu, the Lord's Prayer, can be translated as either give us our bread continually or give us our continual bread. Now, one of the early church fathers, Origen, who was lived in the second century, states that in un no uncertain terms, Yeshua taught the Avinu prayer, the Lord's Prayer, in Hebrew, and that it was later translated to Greek. What's also interesting to note, according to Origen, that the authors or the translators of Matthew and Luke struggled to find a word that could faithfully convey in Greek the meaning of Yeshua's Hebrew prayer. When an adequate Greek word would not be found, they simply invented a new Greek word. In other words, the Greek word, eousion, epiousion, I think that's how you say it. I don't do Greek. Epiousion, used in the Greek translation of the Avinu and Lord's Prayer for the Hebrew word tamid, was made up. It didn't exist in the common Greek language. In other words, can you imagine? Because you know, we we're taught Hebrew is a dead language, that Yeshua spoke Aramaic, may have spoken Greek, but just for haha, -ha, say he's teaching his prayer in Greek. Can you imagine him praying, give us our bread, epiousion. The people would have probably just stared at each other, looking around going, what in the world is he talking about? Because the word was made up. It did not exist in the Greek language. I personally would consider this further evidence that Yeshua did teach the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew, the Avinu Prayer. 
Now, in searching the internet, as we know, the internet is always true, <laughs> as to how to pronounce the made-up Greek word, one pronunciation was given to me by spelling the word. So it says, how to pronounce epiusion. But it doesn't say that. It says, E-P-I-O-U-S-I-O-N. And that's how it pronounced the name. Doesn't help, does it? Then I found another place where it says the word epiosion, what it means in the Bible. And it says this definition. Can you throw that up? Epiusion is a Greek adjective used in the Lord's Prayer's verse, and it gives you the whole Greek. Give us today our epiosion bread. Because the word is used nowhere else, its meaning is unclear. It is traditionally translated as daily, but most modern scholars reject that interpretation. Now here's the funny thing. It doesn't go on to say, well, what do these scholars say it means? It just says, it's unclear, and it doesn't tell you, you know, they don't believe that it means daily, but they don't tell you what it means. So then I find another site by a Catholic priest who's been teaching and giving a teaching on this, and he gives the definition, and this is how I found that you pronounce it Epiusion was from him. And he says the meaning is super substantial bread. Super substantial bread. Meaning the bread in reference to the body of Christ is a super substance. You know where he's going with this. Therefore, a super substantial bread gives way to the belief of transubstantiation, which they believe that if you, as soon as you take the bread, the host, and you eat it, it now turns into the body of Christ. This belief was brought on by the fact that Jerome, who was another early church father in the second, third century, he ended up finishing and writing the Latin Vulgate, which was the Bible of that time now, uh, where now the kind of formed the Catholic Church. They separated from the Greeks because now they had the Bible in Latin. And it was completed around 405 AD, but Jerome states that in Matthew, the translation reads, give us our super substantial bread. But then his translation in Luke, when it comes to the Lord's Prayer, in Latin, he translated as give us our daily bread. So which is it? Understand that when Yeshua prayed and taught this prayer, we can understand he used tamid, the Hebrew word, which means with unfailing regularity. You see how it doesn't, try to put that in a poetic King James verse, right? With unfailing regularity or uninterruptedly, which is a well-established word in Hebrew, well-known to the people he was speaking to. Now, when we look at the word bread in Hebrew, which is lechem, this word has a broader meaning than just simply bread. See, so how many of you hear, you know, where, you know, clergy get up and they talk about Bethlehem, lechem, the house of bread and, and all of that, which is true. But it, Hebrew, again, has many, many different meanings. You can take the same word, and when you go to a good Hebrew uh, translation, uh, um, lexicon, you'll have that word, but then it'll have the verses that that word was used, and, each, and how they're used in the Hebrew changes the definition. So but what I'm saying here is you can't just go to a strong concord and see that word and say, that's it. Because depending on how it's used in the verse makes a difference in what that word actually means. Now, when we look at the word bread in Hebrew, the word lechem, it signifies a basic food substance. So when Yeshua taught the Avinu prayer, when he taught the Lord's prayer to the Jewish people, this word lechem meant different things to various people he was speaking to. For example, to a farmer of grain, lechem would more than likely mean bread, his substance of food. But to a shepherd, it may have meant meat, lamb, or to a fisherman, to fish, right? Fish. Like a, a daily provision of food needed for them to survive from starvation. So praying for an uninterrupted, continual, unfailing supply of lechem was not some spiritual concept, but a matter of life and death for most. It may be hard for us to even so much as even comprehend this thought process, the importance of continual food source. Why? Because our advances in technology over the years, we have 
produced high yields of food, have we not? Not such great food. GMO and all this other stuff that's in, you know, the foods and things. But we have wheat, corn, rice, et cetera, and so forth and so on. Now, we rarely have to worry about starvation, is my point. Like the people did in the time of Yeshua and other places in the world today. Now, you may be thinking, if food is so plentiful, if that's truly the case, then why are there so many people starving in various parts of the world? Because these food supplies that are available are not given to the poor, not given to the hungry people who so desperately need it. As a matter of fact, do you know that our government pays farmers at times to destroy their crops, to destroy the food? Why in the world would we do that? And then you look and see how the one who owns the most farmland in the United States, guess who that is? Bill Gates. I just don't see Bill Gates as a farmer. So why would he be buying up all the farmland? Now you may be thinking here also, what's this got to do with, with much of anything? Well, for many of us, we're able to eat as much as we want whenever we want. Are we not? Simply go to the refrigerator, go to a grocery store. But are those times even starting to change for us now? For the people in other parts of the world and even in our own nation, there are those who still go hungry today, barely with enough food to eat. For many of us here today, God has answered our prayer of continually providing our daily bread, God's continual provision in our life. And as we saw the basket, the well to well, we've been doing. And you see the picture up there, it's overflowed with sand. We've collected more than we were originally going to do. But this does not mean that we stopped giving to this. We're going to be taking up the last offering for well to well, which is where we are collecting money to uh, build wells in Ethiopia. No, in, in Zimbabwe, excuse me, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe with uh, Pastor uh, Casey. And uh, what we're doing is, is providing enough money for these villages to have their own source of water so where they don't have to walk so far to get fresh water, something, again, that we take advantage of. Amen? That's right, Zimbabwe. Now, an example of how God sustains and nourishes we don't need to go any further than the children of Israel in the wilderness. When manna, the heavenly bread, fell from the sky six days a week for 40 years. How many of us would complain getting the same thing, falling from the sky every day for six days out of seven, 40 years? How many of us complain over leftovers just in one night? Just me? The only exception of God's provision during this time was that they were not allowed to save manna for the next day. In other words, there were no leftovers. They had to trust God for each and every day that manna would fall from heaven and sustain them. There was one exception, however, and that exception was they could have leftovers the day before the Sabbath day so that they would not be out working, collecting manna to eat on, and that they would take that day as a day of rest and meditate and give thanks to God. Now, in studying the Venu, the Lord's Prayer, we find that there is more than just the literal meaning for the word bread. In a symbolic sense, in the Hebrew thought, bread is often a metaphor for the Torah, the Word of God. The bread of life, meaning the Word of God, which nourishes and sustains our soul and our spirit. How many of you, when you're going through a, a time in your life and you pick up the Word of God, it just always seems to go to a place in the Scriptures that meets the need that you're going through at that particular time, in that particular moment. Deuteronomy 8.3, God says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, that comes from the mouth of Yahovah. In other words, you can eat to your contempt, but it doesn't mean that all is going to go well with you. Because we need to eat from the well, the word of God, amen? Drink from the well and eat from the word of God. We need to look no further than what is happening in our world today, like I shared earlier, how people have been turning away from God. Society has abandoned the spiritual nourishment that comes from God's word, spoken from the mouth of our Heavenly Father and recorded in the scriptures, amen? 
What people fail to see is the spiritual bread that nourishes and satisfies us in a way that physical bread just can't seem to nourish us. Isaiah 55, 2 through 3, says, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? I've shared numerous times that there was a time in my life when I kind of turned my back on God, and I was looking and trying to satisfy my life by buying TVs, VCRs, all the technology gabbits, the computers that were starting to come out and all these things. And let me tell you this, it did not satisfy. It satisfied for a moment and then you had to go and get the next newest thing. That's why you see technology changing the way it is with TV set. They'll change from HDMI 2.0 to HDMI 2.1 and people are ready to trash their TVs just to get that one little step clear of their HDMI for their video games, they, you know, to go to the 2.1. Let me just share, we still have an LCD television. They don't even make those anymore, they stopped. Uh, we got that, I think, when our daughters were in high school. Mm -hmm. This TV's over 15 years old, still works great. And you don't get burned in or none of that other stuff, amen? Then he goes on to say, listen diligent to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. My friends, it's the word of God, the bread of life that feeds our soul in such a way that nothing in this world can satisfy. So when we pray the words, give us our bread continually, give us our bread daily with unfailing regularity, we are asking our Heavenly Father to plant His word into our hearts, that we may continue to grow through the nourishment of His life-giving bread, the word of God that fills our soul with satisfaction and delight. This is why Yeshua knew that the Hebrew word tamid was what was needed to be expressed in the prayer that he shared with them, both literally and symbolically meaning bread. I believe we are coming to a time when the prophet Amos foretold that therefore would be a famine that people would desire and long for the word of God throughout the land. You say, I don't see it. How it's coming. I believe this time is coming and we need to be ready. And here's what it says in Amos 8. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Wow. My friends, let us make sure that we are in tune with God, that when these times come, we will know where to find it, that it will be written upon our hearts to where we'll be able to know and quote the word of God, remembering what we read daily in the word of God. Amen? Wow. It's when we don't turn to the word of God. And, and, and you know, I was talking with somebody and, and they were telling me how the Catholic church, I'm not, I didn't come from a Catholic church, but how they don't encourage anybody to read the word of God. They don't encourage reading of the Bible. We'll tell you what it means. That's a dangerous place to be. And that's why I think when the Lord shared with us that many believers would be deceived in the end times that are coming. Understand that when we pray these words to God, give us our bread continually. We are asking our Heavenly Father to provide not only for the sustenance needed for our physical needs, but to provide the heavenly bread, the word of God that is needed to sustain and nourish our soul and spirit as well. As well as soothing and warming our hearts so that we may meditate on his word both day and night. Joshua 1, 8 through 9. This book of the law, God says to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. How can we do what's written in it if we don't know what it says? For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. How many in the times of church today we just read, and the word says, and you will make a way for you to be prosperous, and you will have good success. But they don't share with you that you need to understand and obey the law, the word of God, understanding the word of God, meditate on the word of God day and night, that, you know, you need to be careful to do all these things that it's written in it. You need to be obedient to the word of God. They don't tell you that part. They just, we preach these prosperity messages. 
Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. And let me just echo that to each and every one of us here today. To be strong, be courageous in the times you're in. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen? He is with you no matter where you plant your feet. Amen? He is with you no matter where you go in your life. Now, there's another form of bread that we need to partake continually and daily of, and that is the bread of life. Who is who? Yeshua. Jesus. John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Hallelujah. Then he goes on to say in John 6, 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Remember, just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean you have eternal life. You need to believe. Amen? Amen. I am the bread of life. We need to believe that he is the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. That is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. Hallelujah. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He spells it right out, the cross. He gave of himself physically, his body, his blood spilled for the forgiveness of our sins, that we could have an eternal life for those of us who believe in him. Yeshua came into a dark world and he announced the good news of a kingdom of light and that he, in fact, was the light of the world. And who are we called to be? The light of the world. He said he came to bring us peace. He came to bring us joy. He came to not only bring us life, but an abundant life. And that he was the only way to that kingdom of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. Amen? But in order to live that kingdom life, one had to eat from the bread of life. And understand that there are many things that were difficult for the people of that time to understand. Imagine, he, he was, they was considered him a rebel. Some consider me a rebel by even just going back and, and just going back to the origins of things. Of where, you know, where the Hebrew and what this means and what it says and, and, and looking at these things. Yeshua at that time was considered to be a rebellious individual because he came against the Pharisees and the Sadducees in many areas of his life and their lives. The pride to bring the church, the people, back to the presence of the Father. He spoke of things they did not want to hear. But he also spoke of things and gave of substance, did he not? It's better that because people truly don't understand him many times in today's world, I think people fail to and choose to live in darkness rather than live in the light, the kingdom of light. But could it be that it's because people don't truly understand him? That they miss out on who he really is because of preconceived ideas that they have been taught? Think about it. Centuries of time, preconceived ideas have flooded the church to where it's not what it was always meant to be. And this is why I believe it is so important to read the scriptures as if you're reading it for the very first time. And let the bread of life, the word of God, reveal to you, Yeshua, the bread of life, and who he truly is. At the time when Yeshua walked the earth, the people were fine with the bread that he fed them. Come on, right? We love, give us free bread, give us food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when he came and declared himself to be the bread, the bread of heaven, then they had issues, they had problems. Many of them left when he told them to eat of my body and drink of my blood. They all left, those who had been following him, to where he turns to his own disciples and says, are you going to leave me too? Many times it was because he did not meet their expectations of who they had been told the Messiah was. See, they were looking for a king, like a King David, who was going to defeat the Romans and give them back their liberties and their freedoms and let them become a great nation again, like King David was. So my question is this. Are we any different today? How many people have become so comfortable in what they believe that Yeshua and the Christian, in their things about Yeshua, about Jesus and their Christian faith, that they settle for the shadows of what other people have told them to believe rather than the reality of who he really is. 
That's an important question to ask yourself. Am I just going through the steps? Am I just going through these things because this is how I was raised? Do I just show up for church because of all my life I've shown up for church? It's so easy to be influenced today by our Christian culture and lulled to sleep, living in a state of complacency to where we miss out on the exciting journey towards discovering who Yeshua really is. I shared a story, and I'm just going to share it again, about a couple who were in Iran, and they were able to escape the tortures and the persecution, them being Christians in Iran, and came to the United States. And after being here a while, the wife went to her husband and pleaded with him, take me back to Iran. The church here is asleep, and I'm being lulled to sleep. In other words, she would rather go back and face persecution, even possible death for her faith, than to stay in the United States and be lulled to sleep. When was the last time you began to think new thoughts? Dream dreams, see things in a new way and in a new light while pursuing first the kingdom of heaven. If not, this has, hasn't happened. Could it be that we've hardened our heart and we've allowed our spirit to become dull and complacent? Having a preconceived idea of what it means to belong to God to where we have failed at allowing ourselves to be stretched, to step out in the areas where God has told us, have we put the lid on our own selves and we're comfortable being in our little jar, comfortable being where things are right now, Seeing the whole world go to hell in a handbag and, and we oh, well, we're comfortable right where we we're at and right where I'm at and, and we don't bother with anyone else or anything else. And, and the Lord says, let me out. Step out. Step out of the box. Step out of who you are. How many are afraid of facing the challenges that Yeshua brings our way? Because it may mean that we need ourselves to change our priorities and our values. And when we change our priorities and our values and align them with God's morals and standards according to his word, the bread of life, it is then when we will begin to partake in eating fresh bread. Fresh bread. Not even bread from the hostess outlet. Amen? <laughs> but eating fresh new bread from fresh revelation. Yes. Living fresh bread that came down from heaven. Yeshua. He said, I am the living bread. He didn't say, I'm the stale bread. He didn't say, I'm the dead bread. Or he didn't even just say, I'm the bread. He says, I'm the living bread. Living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And how many of you like fresh bread? One of my favorite things recently has been making bread. I bought a bread machine. When I found out how easy it was to make bread, I'm like, wow, this is cool. And so the point is, then I bought a bigger, a better brand of bread machine because the ones you get, they make these like 10 foot high, you know, loaves of bread that you can't put anywhere or even put in the toast. You got to keep flipping it. So I got another machine that makes the bread like a normal sized bread. And there was a time when I even had both bread machines going. But there was nothing greater than walking into a house my home and smelling fresh baked bread cinnamon raisin bread that's my favorite <laughs> Yankee candle can't even do it justice amen fresh baked bread awesome the aroma the being in the presence of the house and isn't it just like with God fresh bread to where we smell the living aroma of a living God. Yes. Being in his presence like there is no other. Amen. Yeah. When the presence of God is no longer in this place, we might as well shut the doors. Amen. Amen. But understand, being in the presence of God can even shake us to the core at times. Because it begins to reveal things. Maybe sometimes we get more into a worship mode than a praise mode. I think sometimes we're afraid to get into a worship mode because it's during the times of worship when God begins to reveal things in us to where everything we do is like a high praise because it's shedding off and we got so much stuff to shed off that we don't take the time now to worship. I love you, Lord. 
I was sitting here today, I'm thinking, oh man, we should get into, I love you, Lord, or oh Lord, you're beautiful, and get into worshiping him. Songs that lead us and bring us to a place of repentance because we begin to see us for who we truly are. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing to come to the altar, not because the pastor tells you to, but because you feel the unction to get out of our seat and come to the altar. When is even the last time you felt the unction of God to move you out of your seat? Listen, we, it's okay to do that here. Melody, we see her dancing before the Lord and others dancing before God and, and coming before. We need to be free to do what God instructs us to do. Listen, if we're so tight in our spirit that we can't even get out of our own seat to come to the altar when God's saying, go, I have something for you. What makes you think we're going to have the gall and the unction to stand before people who are going to persecute and even maybe you face death? You won't. I'm telling you right now, if you can't even get out of your seat to come to the altar, there's no way you're going to be able to stand up for the word of God. I'm telling you. And, and many times you don't realize and know until something tragic in your life happens to you. When something tragic happens to you, then you really begin to see who you truly are and what you're willing to do. These words aren't the kind of words that are going to tickle your funny bone. But in many of you who know me, I'm not here to tickle your funny bone. I'm just here to speak truth. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. Yes. We need to seek God's face. Amen. Amen. How many know that the presence of God fills the house, the temple where he dwells? And where is that temple? Where is that house? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body, say my body, my body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Where are you bringing the presence of God? Where are you bringing the Holy Spirit with that living within you, the temple? 2 Corinthians 6, 16, for we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing. When I will welcome you and I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. Do you know what happens when the bread of God's presence fills his house, his church. First, the prodigals will come back home, returning from the fresh bread of life that is in his house. They want it. They desire it. And secondly, they won't come alone. They'll bring others. Hey, they want to share with the fresh bread of life. After a while, just the jazzy worship music and all the entertainment that takes place in the church today, again, just like modern technology, wears off. And that's why people jump from place to place to place looking for something more. What more do you need when you're in the presence of Almighty God? Oh, yeah. Amen? Yeah. My friends, it's time for us to quit worrying about being proper and dignified. And seek the presence of God in such a way that he will open up the floodgates of heaven and rain down the bread of life. To where we can feed those who are spiritually hungry. You know... I was always raised and brought up that I had to wear a suit and tie. The only place I ever wore a suit and tie was the church or a funeral. And one day I was at a funeral and everybody at the funeral was in flannel shirts and jeans. And I'm there in a jacket and tie. <laughs> and then I got to the point to where I began to even look out and to the congregation, the people. Didn't see anybody wearing a shirt and tie. We even went to a dedication of a house of prayer, a church. We showed up in suit and tie. No one else did. We felt like fish out of water. I bring this point up to you is we need to be real with people. Amen. I'm in jeans today because I'm going somewhere and I don't want to have to go back home and change. Amen. But there's nothing wrong with wearing a shirt and jeans. That's right. yeah. Tell me, what was the uniform of the day that Yeshua wore? Okay. Yeah. Huh? What priestly garments and robes was he walking around and wearing? Maybe it's because... That's why they needed somebody to go and give him a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane because he looked like everybody else. Come on, think about it. He didn't have the, you know, the big poof hat, you know, the fish head hat and 
walk around with chains and crosses and gold and things and standing out. No, he looked like everyone else. <laughs> See, it's who we are, the character of who we are, the light that shines and emanates from us that tells people who we are. When you've got to tell people who you are, guess what? You're not who you say you are. <laughs> Amen? Do you get that? If you've got to tell somebody that you're a Christian, more than likely, many times you're not. Unless people say, hey, are you a Christian? Because they see something different in you, they may question it. But if we've got to go around bragging about who we are and what we are, many times maybe it's because we're not who we say we are. How many desperately want to eat fresh bread to the point where you're willing to stop at nothing just to be with him, to be in his presence no matter what it costs or how uncomfortable it may make you feel? Give us our bread continually, daily, with unfailing regularity. Repeat after me. Avinu, Shabbat Shemayim, Yit Kadesh Shimka, Viyit Barach, Malhutka, Resunka, Yihie, Asui, Bashamayam, Uva Aretz, Vititain, Lachmenu, Timidit. Our Father in heaven, may your name be sanctified. May your kingdom be blessed. Your will shall be done in heaven and on earth. Give us our bread continually. Amen. Amen. I'll continue with this next week. This next one is, I'll just leave it at that. Forgiveness, a little hint. <laughs>